<laughs> hey, it's Kevin and Fred. Do you have a referral for us here in Phoenix? There are 30,000 agents here that you could send them to. Why us? Well, for one thing, we'll keep you updated and you'll never have to track down your commission. We'll also make you look really good to your client. And best of all, it helps us keep all this content free. So go to kevinandfred.com slash referral to make the introduction. We'll take great care of them. All right, guys, we're back uh, with another episode of the Kevin and Fred Show. And today I am very excited and honored to have Mr. Mark Willis join us today. Mark, how are you doing, my friend? Hi. Uh, I'm doing great, and I'm honored to be on your podcast. I've, I've, a lot of my heroes have, have been interviewed by you, so this is a real treat. Thanks, Kevin. No problem. Yeah, we've been lucky. We've had a few really great folks. I know a lot of people that uh, that you know well, uh, and uh, obviously having spent so much time in real estate, you've probably met just about everybody who's, who's done anything significant at this point in the industry. So really excited to just chat with you, Mark, and uh, kind of just catch up with you, man. I know you've gone through a lot of uh, personal stuff in the last year and it's been tough and it but it's also been fun to see hey now you're ready to sort of come out and uh, I don't want to I don't want to use the word reinvent that's my word not yours but kind of get out there and start giving back to the community again the way you have for so long and the way you built your career okay so uh, let me just say that I like the word reinvent you know one of the things that I remember and this is back from the early KW days I uh, remember that Gary said something. He said that Andrew Carnegie said that the secret to his success was blowing up the factory every five years. Ooh. And I, I think, I, I honestly believe that one of the things that we have to do in life is we have to be comfortable with change. You know, I, uh, I, one of my favorite quotes is, change is inevitable, growth is optional. So I... <laughs> I had a I had a big change event that occurred in 2019, and and I think that's probably what you're referring to. And you know, it I'm, I'm it, I, it actually is therapeutic for me to talk about it. You know, I was uh, I was married one week shy of 35 years, and uh, my wife um, was I mean just like out of the blue, she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in December of 2018. And she passed away in May of 2019. So literally just five months later. And so I took essentially the whole year of 2019 off focusing, you know, primarily on her health and her well-being. And then um, getting into this uh, this new identity for myself because, you know, I'm... <laughs> I have been, uh, I've never been alone my whole life. Never been alone. I went from you know, high school to college with a roommate, got married straight out of college, stayed married for you know 35 years and was with the same woman for 40 years. And, and so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been one of those changes where you go, okay, it's time to freaking grow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> bet. You know, the choice is, what are you going to do? Are you not going to grow? Or are you not going to keep keep going? Um, I, you know, the other thing I'll tell you is that, and and I don't know, I, Kevin. I I have to say that um, I I have this new motto, and it it it's been a bit of inspiration for me, and it's super simple, but it's just KFG. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I know keep, what you're going to say. You you keep that thing going. Yeah. <laughs> I love and it. I want, to be, I want to be respectful because you know what? One of the things I love the most about you know your your whole network, uh, next level agent, is the forty six ten thing, and that is be still and know that I am God, right? Well, uh, so no, so it's actually it's Isaiah. Be. I, I know it's actually Isaiah forty six ten is our team that where our team name came from, which is think with the end in mind or begin with the end in mind. Uh, that's the tra That's the loose translation, right? I think in the book, obviously in the Bible, it says something a lot different, but it, it's about calling the end from the beginning. Um, you, you may or may not remember this, but Fred and I, we grew up in the short sale days. I, I got my license. And oh, my, I remember. <laughs> well, I remember yeah, I guess guys. you probably had to take a few phone calls because of us. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, by the way. Um, uh, my pleasure. But, you know, we were um, – we knew we didn't want our name on the sign and we had this mentor or friend who had taught us about seven habits of highly effective people. One of those was begin with the end in mind and he had taken a class or something that had 
tied that back to Isaiah 46.10, which was like God called the end from the beginning. Um, and for us in the short sale world, there were so many moving parts. There were so many things that we would do on day one that would benefit us on like the seven month mark to be able to get the deal closed to help that person avoid foreclosure. And so for us, that sort of business lesson or principle always stuck out. So I say all that to share. Um, you can say, keep fucking going on my podcast all you want uh, <laughs> because I love it. I heard you say that in another podcast you were on recently. And I just, I thought maybe, you know, if you were ever going to get a tattoo, you would, you would use that saying at KFG. I was like, man, I really like that. I got to ask Mark about KFG today. So I got to, I got to tell you this story. You mentioned tattoos, but so like Kevin, the, the fun thing is that um, back about, uh, the time that I was kind of beginning my process of, um, you know, I guess just disengaging from leadership at Keller Williams. And, and I want to say I have such great respect and appreciation for Keller Williams and so much gratitude. But I went through a period where I felt a little rebellious. And at, you know, 50-something years old, I went and got a tattoo in Maui which is crazy, right? Um, I'd been the most conservative guy my whole life. And now, you know, I'm just, it's back to that whole, it was, in, that was five years ago. And that was another reinvention cycle. And that one says, I am on it. And that's why I, I kind of got into the, the, the 40, Psalms 4610, which is one of my favorite Bible verses, which is, we still know that I'm God. Um, and yeah, if I were going to get another one, it would be KFG for keep fucking going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like you said, you don't, I mean, what are your choices? Why, why would you not keep going? Gosh, you brought up so much there, Mark, that, I, that I'd like to talk about. Um, you know, just the fact of having to reinvent yourself every five years. Um, one of the things I appreciate about you that is that you, and you mentioned this on another podcast once, you're able to, like you just mentioned, you're a spiritual guy. You, you know, um, Psalms 4610, obviously that didn't, that wasn't something you looked up today. You knew that. Um, but you also are very in touch with, I'm going to call it the, I call it like the woo woo stuff. Cause I, I'm like, I'm into all the weird stuff and learning about how this world works, scientific type stuff, uh, as well. And not just this, like, so you referred to yourself as conservative, but I would say you're, you're probably less conservative than a lot of other conservative people I know, because you're, you're willing to explore other things. Have you, have you always been that way? Has that always been part of who Mark Willis is? I, I hope so. I hope so. I may look conservative, but I'm actually not a conservative thinker. I'm a, um, I'm a broad level thinker. And um, I do believe that we are all spiritual beings having a physical experience and our knowledge is limited about the spiritual side. And if you truly believe that you're a spiritual being having a physical experience, then the physical experience that we're having is a temporal experience. It's temporary. Um, and the spiritual experience is a permanent, eternal experience. And um, so I, 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 have, I was raised to think that way. I've always thought that way. And, and I'm so grateful for that way of thinking because it helps put things in perspective at all times. But, you know, one, one thing I will say, I, I think just to respond to your, your comment about the woo-woo or the woo side of things, I actually like the woo stuff. I always have. Um, and I try to live my life really by David Hawkins' map of consciousness. And, I mean, you're an Arizona dude. You, you probably know who David Hawkins is. And, and a lot of, uh, you know, people that I know and respect read Power Versus Force, um, within the, you know, within the last couple of decades. I think I read Power Versus Force in the year 1999 when I was launching Keller Williams offices that were my franchises in San Antonio and Houston. And uh, one of my agents, Pam O'Brien, and her husband, Rich O'Brien, gave me the book Power Versus Force, and I just devoured it. And and it, it was a game changer. And of course, that's got in it the map of consciousness that shows that the human experience, the emotions that we're feeling and, and the, 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 what we focus on, um, you know, in terms of our mind space um, actually is a very real thing. It, it represents an energy that has a vibration and that vibration has an attractor field 
And so just being aware of what we're feeling and the energy that we're putting out is, is a gift in and of itself, because if it's not, not attracting the experiences that you want, then you can, you can, you can actually let go of that, surrender it, and you can eventually rise to a higher level than that level of, of, of emotional energy, and you can experience better uh, outcomes through your, your vibratory attractor field. And as crazy as that may sound to people that aren't familiar with it, it's real easy when you put it in this context. You know, imagine somebody who is feeling a lot of guilt and focusing on a lot of guilt. Well, guilt in and of itself is like destructive. It's almost like you're destroying your own thoughts. You're punishing yourself for what you've done. So when you are punished, you're going to feel shameful. Shameful people actually hurt others. They actually um, hurt animals. They, they have an attractor field that is limited to that perspective or that context of shame that limits any great opportunity from ever showing up in their lives. So how I use this is I like to just be aware of where I am, not judge it, not be hard on myself, just, just sink into the awareness of it and use that as a tool to up level and attract better experiences. That's uh, man that you just gave a, like a, probably a beautiful masterclass on how to get more out of life in the last like three or four minutes there. Um, I know well, you that- can count on me sharing some of this uh, in April at, at the TLA conference. You can I'm, count on it. I'm really glad to say that because you know, a lot of, a lot of the talk out there and, and we'll just, we'll shift to the, we'll shift that gear. A lot of the talk um, in the industry is around, I'll call it digital disruption, right? The different companies, the open door offer pad, Zillow, uh, and, and all of the other new companies that are, that are coming out that are, I'm going to call it looking to get between the agent and the transaction, right? Um, on whatever level. And I think that there's, you know, we can talk about good or bad that d- it doesn't matter how we label it. Um, I think what's really important is we just have to understand that disruption is here. It's, you know, it's always here in some shape or form, but it feels like there's more, I guess, scarcity than ever. And it feels like there's more, Hey, we've, we've got to rely on, on this tech because this other tech, like they're going to get us this open door, Zillow, et cetera. They're going to get us. And in the reality is, is if we do what you just said, we, if we did that, I guess it wouldn't really matter what these companies are doing. We have the power to control our results or to have better outcomes in our life and in our business. Um, can, can I say something there? Please do. Because, you know, one of the rules that I live by is to get in touch with what my intention in any given situation is. And I believe that intention determines all outcomes, not attachment. So what when 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 we talk about you know what, whether it's OfferPad, Open Door, Zillow, all the business intermediators that are that are trying to disrupt you know the the way we do business, the only reason we would be concerned about that is if we get attached to one mindset and we don't choose to evolve beyond that. Uh, the way to fix that is to focus on, on focus on your intention. And, and, and what you intend to accomplish and be open to all the different opportunities that are out there. And, and that openness, I think, allows a, a natural, you know, back to the woo-woo again, but allows a natural flow of what the universe intends for us to have and, and, and for what, what we, we intend to experience being in harmony with the, the intention of the universe. And, you know, I, I always say that my, my intention is to manifest the highest good for all concerned. Period. End of story. Just manifest the highest good for all concerned. And I think if we think that way, um, we, we don't have to have a lot of fear. Um, and, and fear in and of itself actually kind of keeps us in bondage. Um, I, I don't want to feel that way day to day. Yeah. I mean, and and why would you like that is, uh, so uh, let me get, let me ask you this. So let's, if you, when you're, um, you're going to, you're going to be talking to a room full of realtors, you're going to be talking to a room full of agents that are, some of them are, are probably are, are in some fear, 
around what the future holds, what the next three to five years hold in their industry. Um, what are some things, who, someone who's maybe not experienced some of that mindset shift, some of the growth that you just talked about, what are some of the first steps that we can do as, as realtors to start to, hey, let's embrace what's going on and, and let's, what, is, what is our intention about? How can we get clear on that so we can look for better outcomes in the future? So first of all, I want to say that they'd probably be naive or foolish not to have some fear in terms of curiosity about where the industry is naturally headed, right? Right. And so I would acknowledge that that is, um, that's, that's actually good common sense. Um, and, and I wouldn't argue against having fear because I think, you know, one of the things that I said is that as a business leader, um, and this is not to contradict what I, what I said about energy earlier, but I think it's healthy to have a little paranoia about what you don't know, what's coming your way, what could disrupt you, just so that you're prepared for when it does, provided that you don't stay attached to the current way that you do business. Got it. See, that's what I meant when I said intention determines all outcomes, not attachment. If, if you stay attached to the way you do business, that's the outcome that you're, that you're going to get, the way it's always been. And, it, and, 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 and as it changes, if you're attached to something that's no longer valid, you're going to get disrupted. If your intention is to stay valid, and I think the majority of the people that you have at your conference are, are operating with an intention to stay valid and, and, and to continue to get their unfair share of, of business. And I mean, that's, that's why they're, they're out there seeking growth and, and going to conferences and, and listening to, you know, great thinkers like you and, 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 and Fred. So overall, Kevin, I, I truly believe that um, being paranoid or, or being, you know, informed and aware of what is coming or what could be coming is an intelligent way to approach the industry or anything we do. Um, I would say that, um, you know, if, if, if I were predicting where the industry is going myself, um, I, 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 and, and I, I do believe that we have to be open to this. Um, I, I know that, uh, everybody who does a real estate transaction, you know, has done one within the last couple of years, uh, including the real estate agents. I'm talking about everybody involved in the transaction. Uh, the, the way they do business has changed. And I don't think there's any question but that technology is going to continue to disrupt aspects of the industry. And it, it, it may even continue to disrupt agents that aren't on top of their game and aren't uh, growing and, 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 and learning and, and, and developing, you know, kind of their, their own value proposition and their, their, their own um, services for, for how they, they create value for the people that use them. That's a great point. Um, and and I, I, think it, I think it's going to go beyond just, you know, it, it used to be that real estate agents were paid to find buyers and that were qualified, motivated, and, and loyal, or, or even better, find sellers that were reasonable, motivated, and qualified, right? Um, that, that, that were realistic. And um, it, that, that's how the agent's been paid. It, so far, that has not changed. Only thing that, that, you know, and if, if we want to get into how, you know, I think it's going to change, that's only an opinion. And I'd rather deal with facts and, and research and make sure that, you know, we're not just kind of shooting from the hip here. And um, I, I think that the research would just show that consumer trends have changed drastically and real estate agents have got to be, you know, on pace or ahead of the consumer rather than behind the consumer. What concerns me about the industry is that real estate agents, for the most part, are actually behind the consumer, not with or ahead of the consumer. Yeah, you know, that reminds me of something I was talking with Chris Heller on, on our podcast last year. And Chris is obviously 
he's super intelligent. Uh, and I, he's a great friend of mine, by the way. And he's a great, I mean, my, as, as well as mine. And he's just someone that I look to um, at, for, for a lot of different things. And he mentioned, you know, the thing is like, the reality is that consumer behavior now is, is shaping the technology that, that is here, the technology that's coming. And as agents, we're going to have, we've got to find a way to meet what those demands are of the consumer. And I, I agree with what you're saying, which is we're probably lagging. I think overall as an industry, we've lagged in what it is the consumers demanded. Um, technology's changed a lot of that and we're, we've got to catch up and, and get back in the lead, so to speak, and make sure that we're, we're meeting that demand for those, uh, for the consumers. Otherwise we're going to be left looking for something else to do, I believe. I, I, I don't disagree with you on that, Kevin. But, you know, the one thing I keep thinking would be fascinating for someone to offer would be a series of consumer panels uh, where you actually hear from people that have bought or are in the market to buy or have sold or are in the market to sell and, and, and really learn from them about, you know, their expectations, their experience and their feedback. Um, I, I think it's studying consumers and, and their, their trends and the habits of consumers, uh, is the one thing that probably is the safeguard against change in the industry. I like that. Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. Ask anything. I'm sorry. uh, So I, I think you're, I think you're right on there. I think that, um, there's a lot to, to be said there with, 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 trends and what, what it is the consumers are genuinely thinking about and wanting. You said something earlier, uh, if, if I could go back a little bit, about like having a healthy dose of paranoia. Um, one of the things I know about you and, and the way when I met you, you were the CEO of Keller Williams already. Um, and you spent a long time in that role. I don't know the national stats for CEOs, period, regardless of industry, but I don't believe it's 10, 12 years. I think it's a lot shorter than that. Was it, do you believe because you were able to, I guess, harness that healthy paranoia, you were able to stay in a role like that for so long? I mean, gosh, you've been in real estate for what, 36 years or so, 35 years since, overall? Since 1984, 1984, yeah. Has that been the so, thing that's kept you going? Um, one of the things, I, I, I think there are many things that have kept me going. Um, I, you know, I, I've got to say, as far as Keller Williams goes, that uh, it, there, there was a time when we had so much fun doing what we were doing that I would have literally paid to have been there. I mean, it's just such a blast. It was just, he was just working from passion and joy and serving people. And we were growing and, and the, you know, the, the company had a buzz about it and we were kind of the new kid in town and we were disrupting and we were doing it in such a kind and good way that it was a blast. And I, I'll say that when, when Gary Keller, Mo Anderson and Mary Tennant and I worked together, the four of us, it, I, I think we made beautiful music together. I think it was, you know, I, I, I almost, I, one day I, <laughs> I gave that analogy. I said, well, we, we were kind of like the Eagles. You know, there were four of the, the band, the Eagles, there were four of us and we all brought different strengths and talents and everything that we did was a collaborative venture and it was a blast. Um, I loved being the CEO. I, I loved serving the agents and for me, it was a total blast. I did that for, you know, I did that for, for quite a few years and and I think that I got it to a certain level and then it was time for somebody else to come in. And really, you know, a lot of my work was more relationally based and less transactionally based. And I'm, I'm more relational by nature than transactional. Um, it's, it's just the way I'm wired. And I think that based on the size that Keller Williams got to, that it, it had to become a little bit more transactional than relational. And um, I, I think it was time for me to move on. And yet I enjoyed every day I served there. And I have such great respect for the people that I worked with and such great respect for the company. And, and I just have to say that, um, yeah, uh, I stayed paranoid. I, particularly, you know, you want to talk about paranoia. I can remember speaking on panels back in the late 90s 
Um, and Keller Williams was it was worse than Keller Who. We were in, we we were not the most popular company out there, and you know, I'd show up at at, at um, like whether it was a conference or whatever it was that include you know brokerage leaders, and here I was, Mark Lewis, the guy from Keller Williams, and everybody's like wanting to throw rotten tomatoes at me when I when I'm on a panel, and I I, I was the unpopular kid, and so. And by the way, that didn't bother me a bit. Um, that that never bothered me. That actually made it more fun because I knew that we had traction. And I, I also know that people don't um, don't treat you that way unless they fear you or unless they believe that you're a threat on some level. And so um, it, it was actually fun. Um, and I say that with a lot of humility. I do not say that in a cocky, arrogant way. I I think humility is probably one of the things that uh, was a great strength that I had as, you know, have always had, and hopefully I still have that. Um, and, and, and really trying to honor the people first, but that the, the main thing that I always focused on is if I just help enough people get what they want, then I'll be sure to get what I want. And I never really worried about what my win was. I worried about other people winning. And then when you find really talented people, like, you and Fred and others, you know, I think of so many people in Arizona that I, that I love and Keller Williams and, and I, I want to start naming names, but they're, they're great guys. And, and you got really talented people and they're starting to win and you're all winning together. And that is, that's the best time you could ever have. I mean, that, that, that's a joy. That is a blast. I got to tell you, Mark, I I know a lot of the people that that you would refer to here in Arizona and it it doesn't matter Arizona or not. Like when your name comes up, there's a, I like, there's a light up in their eye, a smile on their face. They think of, I can't tell you how many times I've said, there was this one time with Mark Willis and they're telling us about, you know, some, they're telling me about some company event or, you know, whether it was like purely, purely fun or purely educational or some sort of combination, which was, I think it probably mostly was both. Um, the combination is, you know, so you did make an impact and you did, uh, you did win by helping other people win. I could, I could tell that because of the people I know who know you and who were impacted by you. And um, so for whatever that's worth, I just want you to make sure that you know, you did that at a super high level. Cause to this day, there are still people I, I could call, I could call them right now. And they, if I said, Hey, I was talking to Mark Willis today, they, they'd smile they'd stand up straight and they'd tell uh, me a story about the, about the days when you were impacting them in a, in a big way. Oh, uh, I appreciate that so much. Well, you know, one of my number one values, Kevin, is fun. I like to have fun. And so, you know, even though we were, we were uh, kicking butts and taking names um, and gaining market share, we didn't do it without having fun. And, you know, I'm, I, I think probably, um, in terms of my behavioral style, you know, I'm, I'm blessed with a lot of sociability. And so I like to do things with other people as are you, my friend. Yes. Um, we like to do things with other people, right? Yep. And it just makes life more fun. It and sure does. so I would say that all in all, yeah, we had a ton of fun and you can mention their names to me and I'd say, Oh, I love that guy. Or, or whoever it is. And, and I can think of so many, uh, I can just start naming off names in the Phoenix area. I can name them all over Keller Williams, all the people that I love and adore and still care about just as much as I did, you know, when I was serving them and, and, and we still connect, we still talk, we still have a relationship because at the core of it all, it wasn't just work. It was like, we we were buddies. We were friends. I cared about them, and they cared about me, and we knew it. Did you? It was a blast. So, so, is that the way you led too? So I know, like you came in, you were you. I mean, you came in, you ran Market Center Number One. You eventually moved into a regional role. You moved into you launched your own Market Centers. I probably mixed up the order there. You regional leader, president, CEO. So you've done a lot of jobs in the real estate industry. Did, did you always sort of lead that way with a, hey, we're going to be hard charging and make stuff happen, but we're going to have a lot of fun too and build a family, I guess, for lack of it, like truthfully is what it feels like? Always, always. And I mean, it, you, it, you, could, you could talk to my agents from Market Center One and they would tell you that we had more fun. And in fact, I just went to a party 
uh, it was a it was like a 75th birthday party for one of the agents at Market Center One. He he was there, and there was a whole group of them. And I'm telling you, it was like it was like a a true family reunion. It was like going back and seeing your family. I just I love those guys so much, and I just you know they they energize me. They just they bring me energy. They never took energy away from me. And and I guess I'm blessed in that way is that people bring me energy. And um, now I will say that I don't have a lot of tolerance for people that are negative, people that complain uh, and and come with problems and can't come up with solutions, uh, people that aren't giving life their you know their best, that aren't trying. Like I have my. Uh, you, you'll also hear that about me. I, you know, I have my needs, and that is, I need positive people who are can do, who are like giving their business everything they have, um, and and it's right back to KFG. You know, if people that sit around and complain and don't get anything done, they're gonna lose with me every time. Uh, people that are victims, they're going to lose with me every time. People that are being governed by, you know, their their limited thoughts and limited thinking, they're they're not going to really enjoy me. <laughs> but um, I haven't found that you can build an organization around people that are that way. <laughs> I think Just you're probably right. Candidly. Yeah, I <laughs> so know you're, you're right. That's uh, that. But that's I awesome. do value feedback. I love feedback and I will always listen uh, to feedback. And I think that's one of the things that that may have made me a little different as a leader was that if you had something to say and it was valid and I may not like the message, if it was feedback that I needed to know, I always, always listened and I always, always valued it. Do you ever have a hard time determining if this is, if this is feedback or this is complaining? Um, well, feedback always comes from this is okay. So now let me talk to real estate brokers for a minute and, and let, let you, I know you have both agents and brokers in your audience, right? Mm -hmm. But mostly agents, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, one of, one of the things that I always, um, believed and still believe to this day is that when people give you feedback about what you should be doing. Is because they care. So if it comes from a position of caring about our mutual opportunity together, I do always value it. And I, and I see the difference. People that are complaining that are being negative uh, without really caring, who are doing it in a way where they want to tear you down or, or you know, make someone look lesser so they look like they're greater, uh, you can always feel that. And, and you know, the, the thing that I would say is that when, when somebody gives me feedback, it goes right back to intention. I don't ever worry about what they're telling me. I listen for the feeling and the intention behind what they're telling me. Gotcha. Does that make sense? It does. It does. So, so like, Fred, I could come to you and I could say, well, uh, uh, Fred, you know, the, this is something you ought to be doing with your podcast. And if you did this, you might find that you'll get more adoption. Um, and I've been thinking about you and how I could help you. And if, if I came in, in that way, you can see that my intention is to help you. It, it isn't to be just giving advice. Now, I do, I will take it another step. I think that, you know, most people, uh, don't want advice. And so I always try to remember that personally. And I try not to give advice unless advice is solicited. I think that's a, um, I think the first time I read that was uh, in Think and Grow Rich, uh, Napoleon Hill, 35 years ago when I read the book the first time. Um, people don't really want advice. But if they ask you for advice, you can give it. Gotcha. Yeah. And, why do you think that is? Um, I think that um, I think that there are probably um, there's 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 a little bit of attachment that we get 
to the way we do things naturally. And, um, you know, um, I think, I think we, we get attached to our position. That's why I try to give up my attachment. Um, I don't know. Did you, did you ever hear of the real estate trainer? I, I think his name was Danny Cox. Did you ever hear of him? I don't, it doesn't sound familiar. Okay. This was one of the, um, so before I went to Keller Williams, I was at Coldwell Banker and I went to Coldwell Banker's, um, sales manager school in, in Southern California back in the late eighties. And, uh, the last day was, a uh, uh, Friday morning in Newport beach, California. And, um, the, um, the, the, the speaker at eight o'clock that morning was this guy by the name of Danny Cox and Danny Cox came in and, you know, we were all, we were all like, you know, either hung over or bleary eyed or it was super early in the morning. And, you know, I know for me, I, I was speaking for myself. I kind of came in with bloodshot eyes. I'm like, okay, I'm on time, but I, I was only present physically. I wasn't hundred percent present mentally yet. And he walks in the room and he says, okay, he says, first thing, he says, I want you to change five things about your appearance and you have 90 seconds to do it. So, you know, you watch, like, first of all, you're like in shock. Okay, I got to change five things about my appearance. What am I going to do? So people start taking off their watches. They take their shoes off. They take their socks off. They're taking their belts off. They're taking their bracelets off. They're, the women are taking their earrings out. He stops. He says, okay, stop. He says, okay, now change five more things about your appearance. I mean, at this point, guys are taking shirts off, it's, ties are coming off, everything. He says, okay, stop. Do you see that when it comes to change, your context of change is about what you're giving up. It's not about what you're gaining. And we all went, ah. Oh. See, what we didn't do is we didn't trade like watches. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't actually see change as a way to gain things. We saw change naturally as giving something up. And that giving something up actually meant that um, we had a context that was predetermined about what that change meant. And so uh, that, that was one of the, the greatest lessons like uh, of any seminar that I ever went to. And, and I, I, I remember that my, you know, my whole career, I still use it all the time. Change is not necessarily about what you're giving up, but that's your context when you're first asked to change something. You got to move to what you're gaining. That's interesting. Uh, as you say that, I'm 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 processing processing in real time in my head, going, yeah, that is. Yeah. I, think, I think that that's the normal. Even I think for people like like you, for myself and others I know who are fairly or at least more comfortable with change than, than others, it's still go. I'm still going, yeah, that's still a default place to go to, and I could see that. So that's uh that's that's really powerful. Um, so you said that was early on. That was that was while you were still a Coldwell Banker. I got that in the late eighties and I've, 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 kept, I've held on to that one. I thought that was good. I still got to give Danny Cox credit and that, you know, the other thing he did, I remember that, uh, that, that morning. So, well, he had his, his handout was a picture of a frog. And he said, if you, if, if you got to swallow a frog, hurry up and swallow it. <laughs> and if you got more than one frog to swallow, swallow the biggest one first. And you know that that stayed with me also. I've I've just got a lot of uh, quotes and experiences and memories and you know different um, you know educational opportunities that I've had where I've learned things that I just held on to throughout my career, and and uh, that was one of them. So I always love sharing those. Well, I love that number one. You're coming to, you're coming to share some of that stuff with us at uh, Next Level Agents Live or at NLA Live, as I call it. But I also know that you've uh, recently started up Mark Willis Leadership. Is that is was that because you needed you not need want an outlet for that to to share more of that with people? Well, so um, let me just say that I started Mark Willis Leadership um, several years ago, and 
uh, I had it launching and right about the time it was fully launching is when Cindy was diagnosed with cancer. So I put it on hold for a year and um, we are, we are launching Mark Willis leadership. I know you've been talking with Aaron uh, Crawford, who works with me and uh, we now have uh, a manuscript of 45,000 words. So I've got a, a book that's coming out and uh, we're, 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 we're getting busy on that right now. And, and the, uh, the, I'll go ahead and give you the title of the book. The, the title of the book is The Call to Evolve. The Call to Evolve. I like it. The Call to Evolve. I mean, basically, life is all about evolutionary moments. And, uh, you know, when, when, when we get that call to evolve, it's kind of like showing up at a fork in the road uh, where, you know, we, we either choose, you know, the, the left uh, fork, which is, okay, I'm not going to evolve, or the right fork, which is, okay, I am going to evolve. I can feel this, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get better. And I think there are gateways along the way that we have to get through that represent what it means to evolve at each particular level. And so that's, that's in, in large what this book is about. But really what, what I've learned is that, you know, as human beings, uh, we are meant to keep expanding. We are meant to keep growing. Um, just to go back to your biblical uh, analogy uh, with your Isaiah 4610, um, you know, the Lord's Prayer uh, says, give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say give us this day our lifetime bread. Uh, we're supposed to be striving. We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be reaching uh, every single day. And I think that what happens to people is that as they begin to get some of the comforts that affluence can offer and they begin to experience um, the ability to get other people to do things, they then stop evolving. I mean, the classic example is what happens to the retiree who gives up a brilliant career after 45 years and then starts playing golf uh, five days a week. What happens? Watch how long those people live. They don't live that long unless they're continuing to have some purpose, some passion, something that ignites their passion and keeps them going. And so really, I think that, um, and by the way, if you look at um, the most, uh, when, we, when we quit growing, uh, even uh, physically, we begin to reach a point of stasis. Well, what's the most static thing in the world? A dead body. We begin a process of dying. So as long as we're alive, we are meant to keep evolving. We are meant to keep growing. We are meant to keep striving. And in fact, our very quality of life and I think our length of lifespan um, is impacted significantly by whether we choose to evolve and grow or whether we choose not to. You, you nailed it. You just sold a copy of a book. I could tell you that probably a few. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love that. That's Can I ask, can I ask a personal question there? Did that, was that something that you realized that you had experienced yourself along the way and you realized like, Hey, I've got to, I've got to work through this and actually I've got to evolve. Like I'm called to evolve, you know, to, to use the language. Well, you, you, you want to talk about when shit got real? <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> let mean, me just, I, uh, and let me just tell you when the shit got real. When Cindy was diagnosed with cancer, I thought to myself, uh, this diagnosis for me is a call to evolve. And that is, I'm, I actually I haven't shared this aspect with many people. Um, that was the inspiration for the book, was choosing you know, to, to get better when life feels like it's getting worse. Choosing to expand when it feels like your world is shrinking. Choosing to develop new skills when you don't have to. 
you know, what's the alternative to, 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 to wallow and sadness and self-pity and, and, you know, that's, that's just not an option. Uh, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. So that's so true. Wow. Um, Mark, you, you know, I, I gotta say, uh, I feel like I could probably talk to you for another three or four hours. This might be a good stopping point until we meet again next month. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm so excited. It's going to be a lot and of fun. Maybe we'll get three or four hours soon. Yeah. I'd love that. I, I would love that too. I'd love nothing more than that. I, I'd be happy to fly out to fly out there to Austin or, or wherever and meet you and spend some time together. Cause I could, I know I, I could probably pepper you with questions for at least three or four hours. Well, come see me or I'll come see you. I'd love that, Kevin. All right. We'll do that. Well, anything else that, that anything else that we should have talked about or that we, that we should hit on before we wrap up prior to, uh, to seeing each other again next month. I'm just, I'm going to close with just a final comment. Okay. At the end of the day, you know, everything is, is um, in this industry, uh, it, it is about our will to succeed. Uh, we, because we, we don't, you know, in, in terms of the, the way that uh, independent contractors work, uh, the ones that succeed the most have the greatest will to succeed. What I would like to kind of close with is this question, and that is, is it willfulness or is it willingness? Okay. See, I think, it, I think it's all about being willing. And as long as you're willing and not willful, I believe that you'll, you'll, you'll naturally find the place where you need to be and where you want to be. But when you're willful, you're attached to something again you may not like it when you get there i get it that's uh well that is one heck of a thought to end with i know i'm gonna go do some reflecting on that um <laughs> something that jumped out to me is just okay willful that means i i could i'm tr i'm attached to this certain outcome as opposed to like and making it look this certain way as as opposed to being open to and being yeah. willful to what, what could turn out. Being open and willing versus closed and willful. I like it. Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I can't tell I you how much blast. I appreciate it. I had a blast. I got a big smile on my face. Me Real too. big smile. Hey, man, thank you for putting me on this podcast. I've enjoyed it. My pleasure. And uh, I know the, the crowd, the group is looking forward to hearing from you uh, next month. And I'm looking forward to chatting, chatting with you again soon, my friend. I can't wait. All right. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Have a good one, buddy. Cheers. Okay, bye -bye. you too. Bye.